I was on the campaign in 2008, and I was covering Illinois Senator Obama. And um, we had been traveling around on his campaign plane to about eight cities. And one night, uh, he was running against Hillary Clinton. She was still in the race. And one night, we stopped in uh, Raleigh, and there was a big rally. And it was after midnight when the rally ended. And I came outside with my notebook and my pen. I was still writing down some notes. I was tired. It had been like a 15-hour day. I was ready to get back to the hotel. And there was uh, three young ladies on a bench nearby. And obviously they had been inside of the hall listening to the senator, listening to the then senator, now president, talk. And they were crying. And I walked over to them and I said, excuse me, is something wrong? Is there anything I could help you with? Now they happened to have been uh, young white ladies um, and I have to point out their race for this reason. They said that their fathers had stopped talking to them because they support this candidate who happens to be black. Right then and there, I said to myself, I think Obama's going to win because if these three young ladies can defy their mythical fathers in North Carolina, that's probably happening all over the country. It's a new day in terms of uh, judging someone, this candidate, by the color of his skin. So I went back to my hotel room and I said, Obama's going to win. He was still 12 points down in the polls. But I told myself, he's going to win because those young ladies are going to help him get in the office. They're going to change this country. They're going to change America. And I said to myself, when he wins, I have to have a grand epic story to explain to America what this means. When I got back to Washington, to my editor, and I told him, I said, I need a few days off. He said, why? Steve Reese. He said, why? I said, Obama's going to win. Steve said, no, he's not. He's going to make a good showing, but Will, he's not going to win. He said, he's going to win. I said, he's going to win. And I want to go find somebody from the era of segregation who worked in the White House to talk to them about what this phenomenal moment means. And I think he thought I was maybe losing my mind. Uh, but I was just very passionate that there was somebody walking this earth who worked in the White House who could tell me what it meant to have an African-American in the White House. So I started making phone calls, used all my sources and my contacts on Capitol Hill, around the country. I would call people and say, hey, I'm looking for a maid, a dishwasher, somebody who clipped the roses in the Rose Garden, somebody who worked in the White House in the 1950s, 1960s. And so um, I was striking out left and right, left and right. And one day turned to two, turned to three, turned to four. And then about the seventh day of looking, Somebody calls me and says that, I understand that you're looking for somebody in the White House. You had talked to somebody who knows my daughter. She lives in Maryland. She likes your work. That's the only reason I'm talking to you. But I'm down in Florida, and I used to work in the White House. And she said, there is a man by the name of Eugene Allen. She said, if he would have passed away, I would have heard about him. She said, he's quite up in age now. She says, I don't know where he lives, but about 
three years ago, now this was in 2008, she said, about three years ago, that would have been 2005, I saw him standing outside of the White House after we had a reunion of past White House employees. And she said, so that tells me that he's still in the area. And so I got out phone books. I did the old fashioned way, Maryland phone books, Virginia phone books, and Washington DC phone books. Eugene Allen is a fairly common name. And so I st started phoning. I would do five names out of the Maryland book, five names out of the Washington book, back and forth. On the 57th call, I said, hello, my name is Will Haygood. I'm a national reporter for the Washington Post and I'm trying to find a Mr. Eugene Allen who used to work at the White House. And this elderly man said, you're speaking to him. Ah, and that was my eureka moment. I had found him, I had found him. It took me a week and a half, but I had found him. I found him on the phone and I said, sir, I would like to come over and talk to you about this moment in history. I heard that you worked for three American presidents. And he said, excuse me, it wasn't three, it was eight. He said, from Harry Truman to Ronald Reagan. I mean, I was astonished. And I said, Mr. Allen, can I come over and sit with you and talk to you about your life? He said, well, let me ask my wife. He said, honey, there's a man on the telephone. He wants to come over here and visit me. Uh, he's a writer for the Washington Post. And she said, he wants to talk to you about what? And he said, well, I, well, honey, I guess my life working in the White House. And she said, well, tell him he can't come tomorrow because we both have doctor's appointments. So I had to wait a day, didn't hardly sleep, I mean, because I just sensed, wow, if he worked for eight presidents, that's really something. Anyway, it was a Friday. I went over there. Uh, the election was four days away. Maybe it took me a little bit longer to find him. And, but anyway, the election was four days away. And so I go into his house and he turns to me and he says, me and my wife, we watch this game show. The price is right. So I'll talk to you, but only after I watch it. And I said, sir, that's fine. I love that show. And so before I even took out my notebook or my pencil, I knew, and this is, I think is important for young writers and young journalists, you don't want to go in to people's sacred home and give them the feeling that all you want to do is take, take information from them, take. You, 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 you want to give them a sense that you care about the fact that they're going to be spending their time with you to help you on this story. I mean, it's, you know, it's just very important. After we watch those two shows and after we talk for s several hours, his wife turns to him and says, honey, you can show him now. I had no idea what this meant. He stood up, a frail elderly man, and asked me to take him by the arm and walk me uh, through the dining room into the kitchen. And there was a basement door and it had a big padlock on it, which I thought was sort of strange. I mean, why does somebody have a big padlock on their basement? So he takes out his keys and he says, hold on to my arm because the light switch is in the middle of the room and you have to follow me down here, it's gonna be dark, then, and then we'll get to the center of the room and I'll switch the light on. And we got down there, he switched on the light and it was like I had been taken behind um, this magical curtain. There were photographs of him and every president that he had ever worked for 
him and Gerald Ford, him and Richard Nixon, him and Jack Kennedy, him and him and Dwight Eisenhower, him and um, all these guests at the White House, uh, Lena Horne, him and Duke Ellington, him and Frank Sinatra, him and Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, uh, here was a painting that Ike had painted for him. Here was a, um, a big Stetson cowboy hat that LBJ had given to him. And it was like my head started spinning because it was this big room that had this feeling of this kind of hidden Smithsonian archive. I mean, with this African-American man who was the center of this story. And uh, I had never seen anything like it. And I knew right then that I had a special story. And so he took me all around the room explaining, uh, this is uh, me getting ready to take my first trip on Air Force One. Uh, this is me with the President uh, uh, Nixon in Sydney, Australia. Uh, in all these moments, he was everywhere, Harry Truman. He worked for Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, Jack Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, uh, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, eight presidents. That's an epic life across 34 years. And um, I remember walking over to him uh, and I said, Mr. Allen now, are you sure that nobody has ever, ever written a story about you? And he said something that was just so heartbreaking. He said, if you think I'm worthy, you'll be the first. It was just heartbreaking. I call him because I set up a photo assignment. Now, it's Friday when I spent this whole day with him. so. I set up the photo assignment for Sunday. And um, on Monday, the day before the election, I called Mr. Allen and his wife to check to make sure that the photos, that the photo assignment went fine. He answers the phone. It's the day before the election. He said, she's gone. I said, who's gone, Mr. Allen? He said, my wife. She's gone. I said, she's gone where? You know, to the store or something? He said, no, she died. And I said, excuse me? He said, she didn't wake up. She died. And I, 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 I was stunned. I was shocked. I was grief stricken. Um, just the whole nine yards. I didn't think I could write the story. Um, and his his son later told me that he came over to visit his mother that Sunday, uh, two days after I had spent the whole day with him, and she, uh, Mrs. Allen, and she said to her, to her son Charles, I'm so happy a writer finally is going to pay attention to my Eugene. He's going to be written about. A writer for the Washington Post, Will Haygood, he came over and he's going to write a story. He spent the whole day with us. We took him down the basement and everything. And I'm so at peace, she said to her son, Charles. I'm so at peace. I'm so happy. She went upstairs and went to bed and died. Fifteen months after I knocked on that door, Mr. Allen died. And his story would have been forgotten. Now his home in Washington, D.C., 710 Otis Place, has recently been named to the local historic register. It is a historic home. School children will go visit his home. They will, they will walk by his home now. Future generations will visit his home. I'm very proud of that. And I'm very proud of what he did, his service, to his country. Uh, he made service elegant. He made service a high calling. He was 
as somebody said, one of the movie executives said, Harvey Weinstein, I think, said, uh, he was a fly on the wall for 34 years at the most powerful address in the world. Now, look at that. I mean, and, I mean, how many people keep a job these days, you know, even five years? I mean, let alone 34 years. People came and went, came and went. He didn't care if the president was Republican or Democrat. He loved his country. He was a patriot in the truest sense of the word.